Hello everyone, Tyler King here with a brand new episode of New Review. I know that's been a long time. I apologize for that. I'm trying to get better at it. But today is a very special occasion uh, because I'm going to be doing a review of the brand new Gary Newman album, Savage, Songs from a Broken World. And Savage is something like the 21st studio album by Gary Newman. He's He's, he's got a lot. I reviewed practically all of them, uh, and this is a brand new one. Uh, it was initially announced in November of 2015 through a Pledge Music campaign, um, and it was finally released just uh, about a week ago on September 15th. Now, it was originally given a 2016 release date, uh, and it was delayed for a number of reasons. The primary one really being the death of Gary's mother, Beryl Webb. And stylistically, we are looking at another continuation of the industrial rock sound that he has implemented since the Sacrifice album from 1994. And he continued onward in Exile and Pure and Jagged and Dead Sun Rising and Splinter and now Savage. I, I will say there is a bit more of a like Middle Eastern feel to the album, uh, especially on a few songs. It kind of harkens back to the title track of the Splinter album. And whereas Splinter and, I mean, really a, a lot of Gary Newman albums tend to be about kind of what he's going through at that particular time, I mean, with a couple of notable exclusions. Um, Savage is more of a concept album. This is really his, his first concept album, I would say, since, like, since the Replicas album in 1979. And this one is about... I'm trying to think of the right way to say it. It's post-apocalyptic civilization has pretty much ended the world is now this vast desert due in part to the effects of global warming and so it's about these people who live in the desert and this kind of melding of western culture and eastern culture and the way that gary puts it is that then there's the reintroduction of an old religious book which of course is going to be the Bible, because Gary still got a big beef with God, even though he says that God doesn't exist, so I'm not going to get into that. Uh, but that is really the concept of the Savage album. And production is going to be handled yet again by Aid Fenton, who's produced the last couple of Gary Newman albums, uh, notably Dead Sun Rising and Splinter. Um, it, was, it was kind of a shock, I guess, that Aid was going to be producing this one because supposedly he and Gary had had a pretty bad falling out a couple of years ago following the release of the um, From Inside soundtrack that they had worked on together. But it's nice to see that they have mended their friendship because like on Dead Sun Rising and like on Splinter, the production here is some of the best on any Gary Newman album. Uh, Aid also does mixing, and he plays keyboards on it, and he does programming. Uh, Steve Harris from Gary Newman's live band plays guitar on it. Um, who else is on this? Tim Slade plays bass. And then Gary, of course, does vocals and keyboards. Um, at least that's what he's credited with. Credited with. Um, I'm sure that he did more on this album, though. <laughs> And another thing to note is that Gary's daughter, Persia, does actually make an appearance on the lead single, My Name is Ruin, doing uh, backing vocals. So let's dive right in into the first new Gary Newman album that's been released since I started doing these reviews, Savage Songs from a Broken World. The opening song is Ghost Nation, which I would say is probably the most atmospheric album opener since Pressure on Jagged, um, which is suiting because Pressure did also have kind of a Middle Eastern flavor to it. Uh, here we get this very, you know, low resonant drone. Uh, we get these like pulsating sound effects and we get this very city synth bass. Um, 
there's lots of static going on as well before finally we are treated to the synth pad and Gary welcomes us into this world that we are about to inhabit for the next hour or so. The opening line of the album really sets the tone for the entire thing. Gary singing, we live in a windswept hell where dust and death are neighbors. And he really does do a good job on this song, as far as the lyrics go, with painting a picture of this landscape and this environment that the characters on the album inhabit. There is some very haunting vocalization going on after the first verse that kind of fades behind this skittering beat that really permeates throughout the entire song, although it does make an appearance as the song goes on. Uh, I'm talking about the vocalization. That shows up kind of between or after every verse or so. And of course, it would not be a modern Gary Newman album without some kind of large, anthemic, crushing chorus. And of course, this one has one. Guitars just you know, coming and crunching and crushing out of nowhere. Uh, it has a very anthemic feel to it. I know that I use that word a lot when I'm describing uh, more recent Gary Newman songs, but it's really because the chorus, I feel like, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of taken more of an importance in his recent songwriting than it did on earlier albums. I mean, if you listen to something like the Replicas album or the Pleasure Principle album or even some songs on Telecon, uh, they don't really have choruses. And I know that I made this point with Splinter, but he kind of falls into the same trope again here on Savage, where it's almost kind of predictable where, when, and you know, how the choruses are going to sound when they do make an appearance. And the second half has a little bit more staticky instrumentation going on, it's a little bit more frantic sounding. There is a break between the second and third choruses as Gary sings, We are the heat that burns your skin, we are the wind that blinds your eyes, and that part ends with Gary singing the word keep. It's it's at the end of the line. And there's this weird echo effect on it that kind of takes me out of the song to the point where it, it, it really is distracting. Um, and almost immediately after it, there there's no like payoff with the chorus. He says, keep, and it's like, keep, 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 keep. Chorus! It's not like, you know, here's this extended break so that you can reflect on this entire verse that just happened. Instead, we're just going to go straight into another pummeling large chorus. And that's the opening song. The second song is Bed of Thorns, and Bed of Thorns is, it's not the lead single, I mean, technically it's not even a single for the album, but it's the song from the album that's been out there the longest. An earlier version of it was included on last year's soundtrack to the Ghost in the Shell movie starring Scarlett Johansson. And a very notable thing about this song is that as far as track listings go, I'm not talking about release dates, because My Name is Ruin was technically released before Split, uh, Savage, but... This is the first song, from a track listing point of view, that features any kind of female vocals on it since the Sacrifice album in 1994. And the female vocalization really ha starts happening about half a minute in. It's a very ominous intro. It feels a lot like the title track from the Splinter album, because there is a fair bit of Middle Eastern stringed instrumentation going on as the song picks up and as it leads us to the first verse of the song. And there's this kind of skittering, subtle eruption of static before we're treated to some synth pads, and Gary sings, I'm waiting in the dark, waiting for a dark light to show me the way. And we do get another loud chorus here in this song as well, however, it 
fits this song more naturally. There's no kind of really big break between the verse to the chorus to the verse to the chorus. It all happens a little bit more naturally, and it feels a lot more smooth than the transition did on Ghost Nation. I actually really, really love this song, and the chorus is one of the reasons why Gary's singing, You're welcome to stand in my place, and you're welcome to feel what I feel as the bass, I mean, it just like throbs and pulses behind him. One of the other things about the chorus that I really love, there's this plucked stringed instrument, I don't know what it is, um, but it's going on, if you're listening on headphones, it's going on on the right channel during the second and fourth lines of the chorus. It also shows up during this instrumental break before the final chorus, and I absolutely love it. It's only there for a few seconds, but oh, love it. He mentions that he's pulling out splinters at one point during the second verse, which I'm not sure if that's a reference to the previous album, but it might be. Uh, but just overall, I feel much more... I'm a bigger fan of this song than Ghost Nation. I think part of that has to do with the more personal feeling lyrics to this song. You get some very dramatic piano hits and synth swirls going on after the final verse before it all just really swirls together as Gary is singing You're Welcome, You're Welcome over and over before the song finally ends. And then we are taken into the third song, the lead single from the album my name is ruin this song really quickly became a fan favorite uh which i think is fitting because it's one of the best songs on the album but at the same time it's it's, it's a little bit odd just because of the track length here it's uh it's just around or just over six minutes long um which is also something to note that the songs here are generally around the five and a half five and a half or longer mark. Following an intro of these very dissonant sounds and pulses, we get this very steady, heavy, percussive beat and this very heavy synth bass and synth lead that will bring us into the beginning of the song. And the lyrics here are also more personal sounding. Uh, Gary is singing things like, uh, when, I, when I called you poison, you knew, when they called me evil, I knew. And honestly, one of the absolute highlights of the song here is the appearance of Gary's daughter, Persia. She sings this very beautiful vocal melody um, during the instrumental pre-chorus segment, as well as singing backing vocals during the actual chorus as Gary sings, My Name is Ruin, My Name is Anger, um, you know, so on and so forth. So <laughs> something interesting about this song, though, is that there is a synth lead going on during the pre-chorus segment as uh, kind of right before Persia begins singing, which is practically note for note, I don't say a ripoff, but it's, it, it's a note for note lead part taken from Love Hurt Bleed from the Splinter album. I think there's one or two notes that are changed and instead of eight notes, it plays seven, but it's pretty much the exact same thing. However, I prefer the placement of it here than I do on Love Hurt Bleed, and if you remember my review of Splinter, Love Hurt Bleed is not really a song that I enjoy too much to the point where really every time I go back to Splinter and I listen to it, Love Hurt Bleed is a song that I really end up skipping. Uh, My Name is Ruin, I think, is a far superior song, and I would much rather listen to this on repeat, uh, and I have. And then we have the end of things, and I'm not a fan of this song, and I would argue that this song is kind of the definition of a quote-unquote filler track. We get some off-kilter bells, some strings, some bass before Gary comes in and asks, is that a voice calling me softly? Here's the thing with Gary Newman, and something that an old friend once kind of brought up to me, and I hadn't really ever thought about it before, but Gary absolutely loves singing 
about the dark. He's in a dark place. There are dark things. He's in the darkness. And over these last few songs, he has used the word dark in some variation of it. And on this song, it finally comes to a head with my absolute least favorite song on the entire fucking album. He says, I see a darker shade of darkness. And the chorus has, I mean, surprise, it's another big one. Um, the chorus has some interesting Tom-heavy percussion, but I feel like the song is trying to be more epic than it actually is. There's these, like, snare roll accentuations that end up with, like, the cymbal hits and these, like, string flourishes. And, I, I mean, it just... It feels like a demo. It feels like something that he would have released six or seven or eight months ago during his Pledge Music campaign instead of something that ended up on a fully fledged album like it has. And then next we have And It All Begin With You, which is really the one true ballad on this album. And to be frank with you, I was not a fan of this song initially when it came out. And I thought that it, it, it felt kind of weird, especially when placed next to the other songs that had been released in advance of the album being released. But I think that it works very well within the context of the album, and it really is a nice change of pace, especially after the last song. Again, we we do get this long, you know, ominous opening. For, for me, it kind of gives me the, the impression that the song is going to be a lot faster than it actually is. Um, but after the intro kind of breaks, we get this very pretty synth pad that will lead us into the first verse. One of the other things to note on this song is that it has the highest note that I think Gary has ever hit on a recording when, you know, he sings you during the, um, I guess it would be a pre-chorus. I'm not quite sure because it's not a verse, it's not a, I guess it's a pre-chorus, but yeah, so he has this very high note, which originally I was really put off by, but now I kind of find it endearing. In the second half of the song, during the second verse, we get this more steady skittering beat that comes in. The first half of the song really has no percussion in it, and it doesn't feel like there's anything weighing it down and holding it together until this beat comes in. And we get the return of this arpeggiated synth that was in the intro of the song, which continues and continues and continues as Gary is singing in it all begin with you. After the song, it or after and after the final chorus, it gets very dramatic. We get these very heavy piano hits. We get this very heavy synth just kind of sliding in over us um, and the arpeggiated synth is becoming a lot more prominent and all just kind of swirls together and creates this very claustrophobic feeling. It's like a more dramatic, slower, heavier version of the ending of the Joy Circuit from Gary Newman's 1980 Telecon album. Only here it all fades away and it closes with the sound of uh, rain before the song ends up ending. And the next song is When the World Comes Apart, which was the last song that was uh, given to us before the album dropped. And word for word, uh, the, this is a... When the World Comes Apart is a line from Gary Newman's Magic from the 1994 Sacrifice album. It's weird stuff. We get another ominous opening here. There's a lower synth pad being played that very much sounds like the one that is featured throughout the entirety of the title track from the Replicas album before everything just bursts and we are taken into this very fast paced industrial number and it quickly shows us that this is going to be the fastest paced song on the entire album. Lyrically, my, my favorite part of the song is the pre-chorus. Gary is taunting whoever the listener is. Now do you understand nothing can make it better, nothing can make it go away. 
The chorus, yes, is another big one, but like on Bed of Thorns, it doesn't feel entirely out of place here. And for whatever reason, I mean, this song really references, I think, a lot of other Gary Newman songs, like I already mentioned, the title track taken from Magic, the synth pad seems to be taken from the Replicas album, and the song overall really reminds me of the song Who Are You from the Splinter album, um, which isn't to say that it's a bad song. Next we have Mercy, and we do get, again, another very ominous opening, there's some distorted guitar, this very clangy, like, industrial sounds going on before a very simple kick snare beat comes out of the gloom. Here Gary again is taunting whoever whoever the intended audience of the song is, opening the song with the lines, oh I should have told you, be careful what you wish for. And this song I think is definitely the most sinister sounding song on the entire album. There's an interesting echo effect that's put on to the last line of each verse, which then pushes it into, like, first, I believe first it's the left channel, then the right channel, uh, and, I mean, Gary is just, like, endlessly, relentlessly taunting this person before finally singing Mercy's Overrated, before, you know, this big chorus comes out of the gloom, and you, you know, you've had this, this instrumentation that's just been kind of brewing underneath this slower number before it finally just erupts out and Gary is singing no mercy over and over and over again. The, the vocal timing on the bridge between the second and third choruses I think is a bit awkward, but overall I do think that this song is one of the more rewarding listens on the album. Next we have What God Intended, and this was this is the final song from a track listing point of view that was released uh, through his Pledge Music campaign before the album dropped. Gary sings Save Me From Your World, Save Me From Your Hell over the skittering beat, and this very subdued, chaotic instrumentation that's just kind of like writhing together under everything during the first verse. Here Gary fools us because once the first verse ends and the instrumentation kind of drops out, you think you're going to get this very big anthemic chorus, you know, like he's done for almost the entirety of the album so far, but instead you get this very pretty instrumental break. Um, and oddly enough, there actually is no chorus on this album, or uh, on the song. There is some nice vocalization by Gary going over uh, the instrumental breaks, which are very pretty sounding. I will say, though, that I do think that the song goes on a bit too long. And the next song we have is Pray for the Pain You Serve, which opens with some Arabic chanting and the sound of marching, and it is another faster song like When the World Comes Apart. Although here it's a little bit more dramatic, you get these very um, these very heavy piano hits during the verse. I belong with the faithless. We are no one. We are nothing at all. Sings Gary before this very intense instrumentation and this very like fast beat, fast paced section of the song begins. The chorus is actually a bit more subdued than the instrumental sections would have us think, which I think is a nice change of pace. I love Gary's vocal delivery on this song. I actually love his vocal deliveries on, on almost this entire album. His voice is very, very strong on here, um, but unfortunately the, the song in particular doesn't really do too much for me, and I would go so far as to say it's actually one of the weaker ones on the album. The album comes to a close with the song Broken, which is a song that I thought on first listen was going to be entirely instrumental because it's it's around the four minute mark that we finally get vocals on this song. The first three minutes or so feature this very, um, this very atmospheric synth pad and some subdued strings. And I feel like it's it's trying to go for more of a you know, Middle Eastern feel, 
but to me it, it sounds kind of amateurish like like it's missing something like it's missing some kind of lead and i mean i get that it's supposed to be this this build up to the ending of you know this this album you know this is going to be the last glimpse of this world that we get before this album ends but it, it just feels very incomplete and it feels awkward and it feels amateurish to me. Finally, a little bit over the three minute mark, right around three minutes and 15 seconds in, that instrumentation fades out and we get this very skittering industrial beat coming into the song uh, and these ominous windy synths creep in which lead us into the vocals that, you know, after another minute of instrumentation, about four minutes in, we finally get. Gary here sounds like the lone survivor of something horrible. He's singing, uh, if you had seen all the things that I've seen, you would scream like I screamed before finally at the end of the song, he proclaims that he's seen the whole world die. And immediately after that, everything just you know, kind of fades away. And we're just le left with the ending of this chant and this very like slow screeching sound to see us out of the end of the song and the end of the album. And that is Savage Songs from a Broken World. So here are my thoughts on Savage, and it may be a little bit polarizing for some fans because it has gotten such a great response. Gary has even said on Facebook that this is the album that he is most proud of, but I think that next to Jagged, this is my least favorite Gary Newman album of the 21st century. Which isn't to say that it's a bad album, because I don't think it is. However, on albums like Splinter or Dead Sun Rising or even Pure, all of which have been released this, um, this, this century, uh, you know, since 2000, there are definite songs that stick out the first couple of times that you listen to it, and those songs may become your favorites. They may um, lead you to get a deeper appreciation of the songs immediately before or immediately after. You know, like um, the, the track listing of an album, I think, is something that is very important. Uh, you know, with, with an album like replicas or the pleasure principle or telecon a lot of the songs make sense because the songs immediately before or immediately after complement them in some way i don't feel that with savage to me savage sounds more like a collection of songs than an entire album and i know that there is this theme that gary has said ties the ties the album together the, you know, the, the post-global warming desert world that the inhabitants live in. But really, besides Ghost Nation and Broken, I don't really, I mean, none of these songs directly reference that in some way or another. And I wish that they did. And I know that a lot of people have been saying that there's a lot of Middle Eastern or Eastern influences on this album, but again, I really only hear it in a few spots. I feel like, especially after the one-two punch of Dead Sun Rising and Splinter, this is a bit of a letdown. And again, I'm not saying that it's a bad album. As a whole, it's a bit, I think it's a bit too long. Um, I feel like it's definitely a case of where a seven or eight song album would be much preferred over a, you know, entire 10 song album, but it's not bad. Um, 
just honestly, I think that since his reinvention of himself from, you know, Sacrifice in 1994 onwards, I think that this and Jagged are, you know, the two albums of his I enjoyed the least. That being said, though, there, there are definite highlights of this album. I think that uh, Bed of Thorns is phenomenal. I think that My Name is Ruin is absolutely great. I think that And It All Begun With You is a very touching, sweet, powerful ballad with a very enjoyable ending. There's just... There, there's not enough variation on the album to me. Um... Dead Sun Rising, I mean, he can call it a throw, you know, an album of throwaways all that he wants. I think that it contains some of his best work because you had more experimental songs on it, like uh, We Are the Lost. You had very, you know, stereotypical Gary Newman industrial songs like Beat Noise Transmission or The Fall, or you had very touching, interesting ballads like For the Rest of My Life or the song Dead Sun Rising. Splinter, I, I think, was a payoff because it kind of combined all of these ideas that he'd been working with for the last 20 years into a very cohesive, streamlined album. And again, I do think that there are a couple of songs that aren't the best, but I wouldn't necessarily change the track order or take any songs off of Splinter because from front to back, I think it's a very enjoyable album. Savage, though, I mean, I'm, try I'm trying so hard to get into this album and to enjoy it as much as really everybody else seems to be enjoying it. And, and I'm sorry that I don't. And I'm sorry that I can't just yet. I'm planning on seeing him on this upcoming tour of his in November of course, and I'm, I'm really hoping that seeing some of these songs live will give me a deeper appreciation for it. I, I know that that was the case with Telecon, which is now, now I think is, you know, it's probably my second favorite Gary Newman album. So I'm really hoping that either seeing the songs live or giving the album a little bit more time will make me or allow me to appreciate it and enjoy it the way that I have his last handful of releases. Just unfortunately right now I'm not I'm not necessarily feeling it. And unfortunately, you know, this is kind of this is my least favorite kind of album by somebody who I enjoy in the sense that I really just want to cherry pick a few songs out of it and not listen to the entire thing from front to back, which is a very disheartening thing to say, but that's just how I feel about the album. Um, favorite songs are going to be, are definitely going to be the three that I already mentioned, Bed of Thorns, My Name is Ruin, and, and It All Begin With You. Least favorite songs, I'm just grabbing my notes real quick so I don't accidentally say the wrong song. I mean, least favorite I mean, definitely is going to be the end of things. I can't, I just can't with that song. Um, I would say the end of things. I would say what God intended and pray for the pain you serve are going to be my three least favorites. The last two I don't think are necessarily bad songs. They just go on for a little bit too long, which I think is a complaint that I would give most of the songs on the album. It's just, I wish that this were, like, like, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, Pornography by The Cure only has, I think, seven or eight songs on the album, but I would argue it's the absolute best album that The Cure has ever recorded, and that's a great example of Less Is More. And I just really wish that Gary had gone that route with this album. The other criticism that I have to give to Gary is that I wish that the Pledge campaign had been better. What I mean when I say that is that 
technically he delivered on the promise of allowing us fans who paid early access and bought the album in advance and paid for extra things you know whether it had been like handwritten lyrics or a signed keyboard or you know the shirt that he wore or whatever I just wish that he had shown us more of the process of making the album. I feel like he was like, here's some demos. And then four months later, he's like, oh, here's my next update. Here's the finished songs. It's like, what the fuck, dude? Like, I wanted to actually kind of see what his process was. And I've gotten that with other pledge campaigns that I have backed. And, you know, I just don't feel like that's necessarily what I got. Which is more of a personal problem, I guess. And I know that my my opinion of this album is going to be very... <sighs> I'm expecting some complaints and some criticism of it. And all that I have to say, you know, before you start typing an angry comment saying that, you know, maybe I don't appreciate the album as much as I should, and maybe I don't, um, but the nice thing with Gary Newman is that he's done so many different albums, like for instance, you know, there are people who love the Metal Rhythm album, and, and I really don't like it. But that's the thing about, you know, music and art is that it's all subjective and you can enjoy something I don't like and I can enjoy something that you don't like. Uh, just, you know, I feel like I've made, I feel like I've made a good argument for why I don't necessarily enjoy the album as much as I should. Um, I just wish that I had more positive things to say about the album. I don't, I don't hate it. I don't dislike it. I just wish it was better and I really looked forward to it, and it was just kind of disappointing in a sense. Um, I'm going to show you my notes real quick. Whenever I do a review of an album, I will I always grade it out of ten. When I reviewed, when I wrote down my review for this album, I left it blank, and. Kind of the reason why is because I don't, I didn't know what to end up rating the album. I felt like I should rate it at least an eight because it's it's Gary Newman and has a few songs on it that I really enjoy, but I don't think that it warrants an eight. Nor do I think that it's uninteresting and you know warranting of a six. So for right now, I would give it a seven out of ten. It. It, it may grow out uh, over time, who knows. Um, I'm really hoping that it does because there's some really there's some really great songs on here. Um, you know, I just wish that I just wish that there were more great songs on here. And so that's that's it. That's my review of Savage. So what do you think? Do you agree with what I've said? Do you disagree with what I've said? I'm really looking forward to some constructive criticism on this one, not just, you know, oh, you suck because you don't like, you know, the end of things. Sorry. Uh, so please leave any and all constructive criticism, feedback, positive, negative, whatever, uh, in the comment box below. And, you know, I'm... I really want to get back into doing these reviews because I really enjoyed doing this one again. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So until the next, until the next video, this is Tyler King from New Review, Savage, Songs from a Broken World by Gary Newman, 7 out of 10. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time.